Good evening and welcome to this special launch event of Kurdish Women's Stories, a new anthology edited by Huzan Mahmoud that tells the stories of women who've lived, worked and struggled in Kurdistan. My name is Kieran from Pluto Press, the publishers of this hugely important volume. Before I pass you on to our chair for this evening's event, I just want to say that there'll be a, that there will be an audience Q&A in the second half of this event. So if you have any questions for the panel, please put them in the chat box and we'll pass these on to the panel. Also, the book is available to purchase on our website, plutobooks.com, at a special discount for this launch. We'll put the link and the code in the chat box for you. Without any further ado, I'll pass you on to our chair, Isabel Kieser. Um, I can hear the audio uh, from you a bit delayed. Does everyone else hear that too? But now it stopped. Okay, wonderful. Great. Hello, uh, good evening and welcome everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have you all here with us tonight for the launch of the Kurdish Women's Stories, a book, a really important and timely book that takes us deep into the everyday lived realities of Kurdish women from all parts of Kurdistan. Um, telling intimate and personal stories that go far beyond what we know and usually hear from media reports or official party narratives. Um, before we go into all of that, I quickly wanted to introduce myself. I'm Isabel Kreza. I'm a visiting fellow at the LSE's Middle East Center, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, I did my PhD at SOAS, where I worked on the Kurdish women's movement, and I have worked with Hosan Mahmoud and Culture Project for a number of years. And I remember clearly the day Hosan told me about her idea for this book. We were sitting at the canal behind King's Cross, and right there and then we started brainstorming about how and where to publish this important collection. And um, that was less than two years ago, I believe, so a very quick turnaround for a book. My heartfelt congratulations for such an amazing feat. Um, so what we would like to do tonight is to give you an introduction into the book, and we will do this by having a conversation with Hosan, Ruken, Christine, Ariane, and Vera, or our wonderful speakers um, tonight. And our first speaker um, needs no introduction, really. Um, she's the woman who put this anthology together, and many of you might know her and her work already. Um, Hosan Mahmoud is a Kurdish feminist, writer, public lecturer, and anti-war activist. She's the co-founder of Culture Project, an online print magazine that gives a platform to Kurdish voices. She has written for The Guardian, Open Democracy, The Independent, and New Statesman, among others. Um, okay, Hosan. So I finished reading this book this afternoon, and it left me both devastated and deeply moved. Uh, this is certainly not an easy book to read, nor should it be. Uh, but a really important one uh, to be out there and hopefully reach a really broad audience. For me, its core strength is in its ability to add so many layers to Kurdish women's experiences. And you also mentioned this in, the, in your introduction to the book, wanting to go beyond women as victims of war and beyond the Orientalist and essentialized depictions of the Kurdish freedom fighter. But your book takes us into the houses, into the prison cells, into the guerrilla camps, and into the university halls and gives us an intimate insight into the everyday struggles that these women lived and still live. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to you and ask you um, to reflect on the process of putting this book together um, and perhaps also tell us a bit about the editing process that went into making this book. Sure, thank you. You can hear me, yeah? Okay, great. Thank you very much, Isabel, uh, for the introduction and for all your support throughout this project. And I remember very well as well, uh, the first time I spoke to you and ever since you've been a great supporter and I'm glad that you are chairing the meeting as well. Thanks for taking time. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Pluto Press for accepting the proposal uh, straight away without any hustles or problems and they I have really had the pleasure of working with each one of you I mean there, there were so many of you that I don't want to mention one name and then uh, I, I 
kind of past one. But thank you very much to Pluto Press. I'm really grateful uh, for this opportunity that was given to 25 Kurdish women for their stories to be told and to the world, basically. And I would like to thank our publisher in Kurdistan, Nusiar Publishing, uh, as well, who have uh, published the Kurdish version slightly different as well uh, in November 2019, which I had the pleasure to launch it myself in Kurdistan. Uh, and some of the women whose stories are in the book, they were also there. But um, there are so many people who are involved in the, in the production of this book, um, name like among some of them, Sarah Mills, Dar Daria Najum, Farhad Shomani, Nabaz Samad, Ismail Hamalau, uh, Amira Mohammed, Hetao, Pauline uh, Baker, and uh, Khanda Hamid, Alan Perry from Nusiar Publisher, and um, I would like to thank Isabel Kayser and Fazal Moradi for their guidance throughout this um, two years until now. Uh, uh, you know, so and thank you so much for the wonderful speakers of this event this evening for taking time and i know how busy you all are uh, taking time to be here to support this book and to give your views um, about it that that's really means a lot to me and i'm really humbled um it's very difficult to speak about this book for several reasons. First of all, it's uh, true. It's a, it's a difficult read. It's heavy, uh, especially for those who have not really had the experience of a Kurdish woman. Uh, but for me, I grew up in a war zone. I grew up in a, you know, a family full of Peshmerga fighters in the 1970s and 80s. So, so many of the stories of women told about imprisonment, about armed struggle, about, um, you know, uh, supporting loved ones in the armed struggle and so on, you know, uh, it, it, it all had happened to myself as well and to my family and the female members of my family as well, my mom and sisters. Uh, so for me, it was also to get back in touch with that past, um, having lived in, in uh, exile for a very long time. And that still that con connection is very strong to Kurdistan and everything that goes on over there in terms of women's rights, freedom of expression, and generally lots of other political issues that goes on. I'm involved and um, try to be um, in support of, of uh, freedom loving people there. And there are lots of other stories about imprisonment, about um, armed struggle, about uh, poetry, about literature, about art, about gender-based violence, some of the stories. I mean, you can tell this is a book uh, written by um, different women from different generations. So it's a five generation age 70 to 20 years old. And you can tell the differences, the diversity, the pain, uh, the suffering, the um, loneliness, the uh, love, loss, um, optimism, hope. Um, there's, it's really full of um, different emotions. I mean, you can, from the very first uh, story to the last, you come across different voices, different expressions and how different women in different generations have had a different story to tell and um, how they have encountered life and the dictatorial regimes and how they have responded to these very sudden changing uh, you know uh, life you know in every moment and how they have kept pride and dignity uh, for as much as they could i mean in such difficult times um i was really uh, i would i should say that i cried several times while i was reading these stories while i was editing them getting them to tr to be translated and the other thing is this book ha has been written it's true by Kurdish women, but so many of them don't even write in Kurdish. As you can see, they were because of assimilationist policies in Turkey and Syria and Iran. We had stories written in Farsi, in Turkish, and in Arabic as well. So that's why I mentioned, uh, like uh, I mentioned, some of those names who were involved in the translation from those languages back into. Kurdish Sorani and then also into English. I mean, we had a couple of um, those stories written in English uh, initially, Ruken, who, who will be speaking about her experience tonight, but also Simal. I mean, um, so you can tell that uh, no matter how much assimilation and suppression and exile and, um, you know, uh, different life situations that they were faced with, they kept as Kurdish 
females. They are females, they are Kurdish and their experiences, they write in Turkish, but they speak about Kurdish women. It's it, that person who speaks in Turkish and write in Turkish or in Farsi or in Arabic or in English is a Kurdish woman who have suffered and endured um, a lot of, uh, you know, a problem and persecution and suffering and exile and problems accessing education, problems accessing rights, and, and lots of different struggles within struggles really to survive and uh, as a human being in this world or as a woman and generally as a Kurdish person uh, in different times under different um, dictatorial regimes. Um, so I really think um, this, as you said also in the beginning that um, there were there was a lot of expectations. I mean, uh, still is. I mean, throughout my life growing up in Kurdistan, as soon as you are born and you become aware of the world around you, you are told that you are Kurdish. You have to be different. You have to be strong. You have to, um, you know, even as a woman, you just there's so much expectation placed upon you. Whereas uh, I remember so many times I just wanted a simple life without politics, for example, a simple life that I could go out and not worry about anything, a simple life that I could go to school without uh, <clears throat> hiding from bombardment or uh, without being scared of being, um, you know, uh, arrested, even as a kid. So imagine lots of us, uh, women from my generation and before, and even to some extent now in different parts of Kurdistan, they still suffer all these, um, you know difficult situations and how there's so much expectation placed upon you that's in terms of politics but also in terms of social uh, life and community life again as a Kurdish woman there's so much expectation placed upon you to be a good Kurdish wife a good Kurdish sister a good Kurdish mother or a good Kurdish daughter and that all of these expectations and and we don't know what is this being good uh, it's just means and I think all of it is defined by who we are and what we are surrounded with and how much this lack of independence and lack of protection meant in terms of suffering for for Kurdish people in general but for Kurdish women in in particular there's also all these stereotypes that you know across generations is placed uh, um, upon Kurdish women, either as backward, uneducated, illiterate, uh, you know, back like, I don't know, misogynist, lots of uh, lo who do not know how to represent themselves, who do not know uh, even, uh, even when there was revolution in Rojava, you get all these journalistic uh, or even some, uh, you know, students, they interview you, but they expect too much from you. They expect too much perfection. Oh, why the revolution is like that? Why Kurdish women are like that? Why they are being portrayed as young and beautiful? Why they are being portrayed as this and that? And I think this is too much to expect from a people who hardly can survive Eurasia because being Kurdish in such a region, a region that is uh, marked by violence and fascism and uh, assimilation and, and generally, silencing so you know as i go along i really keep on thinking about who we are why we are in such situation what makes us um being who we are as kurdish women and why everybody suddenly expects you to be perfect your kurdish people your kurdish friends your kurdish family the community everybody and so much uh, like oftentimes you suddenly represent an entire nation's honor or an entire nation's shame and disgrace i mean uh, as i said th this is too much expectation and i really wanted to also go beyond erasure and silencing and also misrepresentation of kurdish women through the media and um um, and all the stories and all the uh, cliches that is attached to Kurdish women. I just wanted to have this platform, uh, this book as a platform uh, for different voices from different generations, from different backgrounds. We have women who could hardly read and write, but we still wanted to include their stories. And there are such powerful, incredible stories of how much a woman can, can do in for example, 1960s and 70s, where, you know, life was hell for, for people who were political under Saddam's regime. So I really, um, I really think that um, 
this book is providing that diversity in backgrounds, that diversity in women's experiences. And also as much as there are violence and, and gender-based violence and other types of violence as well, but there's also resistance. These women are resisting in every capacity at home, outside on the street, in school, at university, in the armed struggle, in the political parties and outside of the political parties. But also I would say one last thing that uh, there is a diversity in political opinion as well. I did not want just to um, provide the platform just for women who are thinking like me. No, in fact, so many of them, um, I don't even think like them. So they are women of, of their own ideas and their own backgrounds and their own beings. And I wanted to, you know, like we have Muslim women who are, you know, uh, speaking from a Muslim perspective, women who are communists, socialists, leftists, liberals, and non-political as well. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to be as diverse and, as possible because so many times people think that we all think the same, we all eat the same food, we all wear the same clothes and listen to the same music. No, life is not that dull. You know, even during the war, even during the revolutions, there are different things. There are different people who live differently and who think differently. And, and that's what the beauty of being Kurdish is. And um, at the end, I would really like to again, thank everyone who was involved in this book, uh, from the publishers, from the uh, contributors, from the those who supported the, the initiative from beginning until now. But also at the end, I would like to thank my daughter who was listening to me from the other room for really bearing with such a busy mom. And, um, you know, and oftentimes I ask myself, as a Kurdish woman with so much expectation, am I really a good mom <laughs> being so busy with lots of activism and writings and talkings and lecturing? So I really hope that our struggle uh, create a better life for the, for the next generation of Kurdish women, be it in the diaspora or back um, in Kurdistan. And there's only one Kurdistan. It might be in our head or it might be in our heart, but at least, um, there's a lot in collective activism and collective revolutions and um, endovers to basically end the suffering, the oppression, the assimilation and the erasure. And for me, this time, this century has to be for Kurdish women to tell their stories, to be you know, resisting fighters, not only in the armed struggle, but in everyday life in their homes and everywhere else in the community. Thank you so much for listening and um, I'll stop here, Isabel, before you tell me off. <laughs> Thank you. I wouldn't tell you off, but I'm sure we'll come back to you. I hope uh, our audience will ask you lots of questions. Thank you so much, Hosan, for um, uh, for opening um, our event. There's so much that I want to ask you already and pick up on, but um, as I said, there will be plenty of time for that later. Now, um, um, we're also very excited to have one of the contributors with us tonight. Ruken Isaac is the author of chapter 16, entitled To Be Ruken or Not To Be Bukit. Ruken has a master's degree in gender and women's studies and is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland, BC, focusing on Kurdish women's activism. She's also a mother of two children. Ruken, please. You're muted. Uh, thank you, Isabel, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Huzan for inviting me to contribute to this one-of-a-kind collection of about Kurdish women in English. I am very honored and also at the same time humbled to share my uh, story with the brave and resilient women in that book. Well, recording women's stories, uh, women's narratives is important in terms of writing her story and also in terms of recovering women's voices that is mostly hidden uh, or not heard in the, in the writing of history. For example, uh, we often hear the heroic stories of men, but not that much of women. But this is changing, especially in the West. Uh, we see more women are coming up and then writing their experiences. And like stories of women in many different areas are covering different topics right now. But documenting Kurdish women's stories is very crucial. Um, the term Kurdish woman, I think itself re refers, to an eth uh, refers to an ethnic uh, group of women, but it is also a very, very political definition. A Kurdish woman telling their own stories uh, would have to decolonize the knowledge blocks on them 
uh, since Kurdish women are mostly missing in the narratives of the nation states, as Kurds, as we all know, they're not even recognized as a people in the first place in Turkey, for example. So I am also a feminist oral historian myself, doing it more, I do it more in an academic setting, in an academic context. Of course, my relation with my inner reviews is not like to get their stories for the sake of the research and then say goodbye to them. I keep in touch with them and then I continue my relation. And also I'm not even claiming to give voices to any of the Kurdish women, uh, since I believe that Kurdish women do have voices but we just need to open spaces for them. So in terms of that, this book uh, is really important. Uh, so the more states uh, wanted to silence, you know, the Kurdish women in the four states, uh, writing and telling their stories as uh, Huzan said is part of resistance that I think. But I think uh, self writing project is very powerful because uh, women are the authors of their own stories. So there is no one to interview you. Uh, you are on your own and also responsible from the, from the context. So there is no intervention. Uh, in that sense, uh, while writing this, the chapter, the chapter 16, uh, I think the process of writing was a productive one for me. And I see it now more often because uh, since I get really positive feedback, especially from the academics uh, who want to assign the book in their classes, this is really exciting. Um, it's exciting, especially that we don't have that much narratives about Kurdish women in English. That's really important. Uh, back to my story. My story is a testimony of a young woman in her teens and early 20s. Uh, it is the story of how Turkish state could ter ter terrorize the lives of young people. I was lucky I survived, uh, but there are still women in prison. Uh, their stories need to be written and through such narratives, uh, we could remember their activism and their legacy. So in my story, I talk about the enforced assimilation that Kurds go through now, today, Every, every time. So the story is about the collective resistance of Kurds in Turkey. I just want to mention something, and I think this is really important. Um, uh, so for Kurds in Turkey, especially telling their stories, talking about past experiences or lived experiences is complicated. Uh, Kurds live in a cycle of state oppression. Uh, so, and usually we do not want to talk about ourselves because uh, the past never passes in terms of curse in Turkey. Uh, it gains new forms, generation after generation, share the same oppression and even worse. Uh, you don't want to focus on your own life while the Kurdish women activists still undergo uh, such violence in a larger scale. Uh, for example, I just read yesterday um, in the news that the former mayor of Hak Hakkari, uh, Dilek Hatipolu, was exposed to a naked uh, search and she was tortured in prison. She has been in jail for more than four years. And there are thousands of Kurdish women activists who are in jail right now. So I think, uh, so it is hard to focus on yourself. As I said, the past never passes in terms of Kurds. To summarize, I don't want to take too much time, but I can also answer the questions at the end. But uh, I hope this collection will uh, shed light on the history and struggles of Kurdish women, and the world will learn more about them. The Kurds are like any other nation in the world who wants to live in dignity. So for Kurdish women, I just wanted to mention that uh, we need to tell our stories, that uh, that's how we can connect with the women in the world. If we do not tell our stories, someone else will tell, will come and be the author of our own stories. Uh, I think we need to tell our stories and claim them in the capacity of authors, whether it is fiction, nonfiction, uh, research, we just need to tell our stories. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you with uh, starting off with mentioning the importance of um, all the decolonizing efforts that are being made. And, and I think that's a really important and ongoing uh, conversation to have. Um, okay, and um, now, um, our next speaker who we are fortunate to have in our midst is Christine Robbins. Christine is currently chair of the University of Exeter Center for Kurdish Studies, which has a special interest in gendered discourses and minority voices through literature, translation and oral history studies. 
Her research has focused on folklore, memory, cultural preservation, and decolonizing archives. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Well, um, Rukan has already made some of the um, important points that uh, I wanted to make, so which is which is absolutely great actually because she she kind of made them really well. Um, I guess um, as a teacher, I'm absolutely delighted that his book, this book has come out because like many other academics, I'm going to put it on the reading list. And this is part of enabling our students to engage with real Kurdish voices, authentic Kurdish voices, and not just reading what non-Kurdish people have written about Kurds, but really being able to engage and hear the voices. Um, and um, on the, I suppose the research side I'm always very interested in in new texts and new kinds of text new ways of speaking that are being created um, one of the things that has always rather annoyed me is that western scholarship tends to say it tends to it seems to think that the individual wasn't invented at all outside Europe ever and so that um, nobody had uh, anything like autobiographies really um, bef um, before before um, uh, before recently, before um, the modern period. But I think that although um, I don't really want to get into an argument with any literary scholars about whether that's true or not, but there's absolutely no doubt that um, in Kurdish society, women are extremely good at narrating their lived experience. Um, they tend not to do it publicly, but they tend uh, to share the experiences often by singing very beautiful and very haunting and upsetting songs to each other and exchanging um, these experiences. And it is extremely emotionally powerful. And um, you get a Kurdish woman talking about this or a group of Kurdish women and just talking about it and we'll all start to cry because it's, um, it's about creating these, these feelings, about um, explaining your feelings, not explaining them, but showing your feelings, how you felt about things, and then reaching out and touching the other people in the room that can hear that. And it's it's something that many Kurdish women have said to me that they find very supportive. Um, and I think that, that that element is present in a lot of these stories, um, particularly when people talk about um, like sudden bereavement, somebody dear to them being murdered or executed. Um, it, it really reaches out and hits you as a reader. It doesn't pull any punches at all. And I, you know, that, that does remind me of listening to um, Kurdish women uh, um, talk, uh, singing about their experiences to each other. Um, so I do think that there's this, there's this sort of emotional connection that's, that's, that's very strong. Um, all, now there's no doubt that of course, um, Kurdish women, like like everybody else, have um, there are these um, perhaps newer ways of formulating your life as a story and as a narrative and writing the story of your life. And um, that there's a lot more spaces that have opened up to do that, mostly for men, but also for women. So we um, we're seeing many more things like um, prison diaries uh, and things like this. Um, and women, of course, are um, talking. Um, are, are also um, writing these kinds of um, experiences, but nowhere near as much as men. And one of the things that's sort of wonderful about this book is that some of the uh, contributions are much more like, this is what my life has been like, and then they talk about it in stages, and some people are saying, well, how did I get here, or how did I become a Peshmerga, and it's all leading up to answering that question. And other people have just like focused on particular moments um, and so that's part of the richness of the book that that I find really inspiring that that it is that it, the texture is also very rich as well as different subject matter. Um, and also the, the the sort of honesty of it and the candor of it. I mean, there's there's a lot of stories about sufferings at the hand of the state, but um, people are very honest about how they suffered at the hands of their families as well. And that that is sort of almost worse to read about it. That's extremely distressing. Um, so I suppose that um, I want to say a big thank you to Hosan for for putting together this amazing kit. Connect, uh, collection and, and curating it so nicely, so well. Um, and also 
that there is, I do remember, I know um, a Kurdish woman from Iran who became a Peshmerga and had the most amazing life story. Um, and I remember asking her in about 2012, well, why don't you write all this down? And she said, oh no, she said, too many people are still alive and they'd be annoyed with me and there would be all these consequences. And somehow Hosan seems to have elicited all these, I don't know whether it's, I don't know whether it's all Hosan's good work or whether it's partly to do with a historical moment, but I just want to say thank you to you, Hosan, for doing that anyway. So thank you. It's 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 really great. Yes, maybe that's a question we can come back to. Um, the challenge of, of um, convincing women to write these often really difficult stories that, that um, might perhaps also um, implica implicate them in a certain way or expose them in a certain way, uh, whether that was an issue at all. Um, great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, um, okay, so um, our next speaker is Ariane Shahvizi, a scholar and intellectual whose work I've been admiring and following for quite a few years now. Ariane is a senior lecturer in ethics at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. She was a judge for the 2019 Literary Science Writing Award for PEN America, has appeared on BBC Radio 4's Moral uh, Maze, BBC Radio Sussex and Channel 4 News, and has written for the London Review of Books, The Independent, HuffPost, Aeon, Prospect, and Jacobine, amongst others. She's writing a book on the philosophy of social justice, which will be published by Penguin in 2022. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Isabel. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm incredibly grateful um, to Hazan um, for putting together this remarkable and groundbreaking book. Um, and of course, to the 25 Kurdish women, um, and we have one of them with us, of course, um, who shared their stories. Um, and to Pluto Press for bringing this fantastic project to print. Um, I was so delighted to have the chance to read it. Um, both as a feminist scholar, but also as a Kurd. And um, I felt, first of all, that the fact that the book kind of falls into 25 short pieces um, was itself very fitting, um, because of course, to be Kurdish is to be fragmented. Um, it's to, to inhabit an identity that is splintered across nation states and languages. Um, and for so very many of us um, to live in a form of exile um, of one kind or another. Um, and so what the book does so beautifully um, is to put some of those fragments back together, as it were, um, to put women from the four lands of, of Kurdistan in conversation with each other. Um, and, you know, several things kind of struck me um, as I read this book. Um, I started thinking at one point of the way in which um, Anna Karenina uh, begins by noting that uh, while all happy families are alike, every unhappy family um, is unhappy in its own way. Um, and it, it occurred to me that that kind of decree doesn't hold for, for Kurds who are sort of all alike in some way in their suffering. Um, and while the collection obviously tells the, the story of 25 very different women um, from very different places, there's a sort of dismaying familiarity to many of their experiences of loss, hardship and struggle. Um, and of course, what that got me thinking was that it is that similarity in pain in which lies an important part of what it means to be oppressed, you know, to suffer in ways in which others who share your marginalized identity also suffer. Um, and so several other thoughts came to me um, as I was reading the volume. Um, and one thing that was quite unexpected, actually, was that the words of some of the women who had shared their stories reminded me of the words of women struggling elsewhere in the world. Um, and so I thought at one point of the former Black Liberation Army fighter, Asata Shakur, um, who's currently in exile in Cuba. And I thought of that quote um, where she says, this context of struggle and being a, a warrior and being a struggler has been forced upon me by oppression, otherwise, I would be a sculptor, a gardener, a carpenter. I would be free to be so much more. Um, and I just felt that that was kind of embedded there in so many of the stories, that kind of sentiment. And I also thought too of um, the late Toni Morrison 
um, who once said something remarkably similar to that too, which I think also resonated with lots of the stories um, in the book. Um, she said, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. It keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly. So you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says you have no kingdom, so you dredge that up. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Um, and I just felt, you know, that sense in which the amount of time, the whole lives that are put towards this struggle, um, when there's that thought in the background of, you know, I could have been so much more. Um, there are all these other lives that, that I could have led. Um, and I think, you know, it's no accident that those two quotations, um, which returned to me as I was reading the book, are from black women involved in the anti-racism movement in the United States, because those commonalities have been noted time and again um, bet between Kurdish feminist work um, and the work of black uh, feminists in the US, um, because of course both are characterized by their exclusion and the exclusion of their concerns from more mainstream feminist movements. Um, and both of course are marginalized groups within states which enact a kind of a form of repression that we, is probably best described as a kind of internal colonialism. Um, and there are also, I mean, there are, there are other commonalities too, I suppose, in that they're both communities that are struggling with internal patriarchies. Um, and those patriarchies are often minimized by onlookers from outside, but also by men within, um, either through ignorant, ignorance or through the demand that the immediate political struggle be prioritized as though it isn't possible or maybe isn't important uh, to try and tackle both of those things at once. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to briefly raise, um, the other point that kind of came to me from the book was the ways in which the story so beautifully and so painfully articulated the fact that oppression often makes very firm affective demands upon the oppressed. And so again and again in the book, and it really hurt to read these, these, these sentences, the women emphasize how important it is not to express their pain. Um, and there's like this kind of pressure that constitutes a whole other layer of injustice. And so in one of the stories, there's this bit where after the death of, of her brother, uh, one of the women says, um, and I, I apologize, I can't remember whose story it was, but she says, what a difficult request it was that you asked us to be strong so that the enemy would not rejoice in our pain, you know? Um, and that sentiment, as I say, comes up again and again um, in this book, and it just adds another layer um, to the pain um, of, of the women who are, who are telling their stories. And so I just want to finish um, by mentioning the person I was thinking of as I read this book. I was thinking of um, my elderly relative, um, who we, we call Gulbaji, um, my grandfather's uh, brother's daughter, or my first cousin once removed. And I know that, that she's my first cousin once removed because um, as a child, after a visit to Iran, I drew this enormous family tree, taped together all these pieces of paper um, to fit on all of these new relatives that I just met um, for the first time, having watched my world kind of branch out from, from this small nuclear unit in the UK to all these, all these people I was connected to. Um, and Gulbaji died last year. Um, I think she was in her 90s. Um, and she'd raised all of her children to be um, Peshmerga fighters, um, which of course meant letting go of them, all each of them in one way or another. Um, and though she was only about kind of four feet tall, she was one of the fiercest and most fearless people I've ever met, um, but also one of the funniest. Um, and you know, there are so many stories I could tell about her, but I felt closer to her reading these stories of resistance and loss. And you know, within that also this, tremendous improbable joy um, and I expect that amongst the many other things this book is I, I think it will probably bring lots of its readers closer uh, to the Kurdish women in their lives um, so thank you so much thank you so much Ariane um... Um, and, and last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Vera Icarius Kelly. Vera is a professor of political science at Siena College in Albany, New York. She currently collaborates with resettled refugees in the 
um, in the area on digital storytelling narratives. Her most recent publication is a chapter called Do I Even Exist? Kurdish Diaspora Artists Reflect on Imaginary Exhibits in a Kurdistan Museum, which was published last year. Thank you, Vera. Thank you so much, Isabel and Huzan. It's an honor to be part of this conversation. So I'm going to try and wrap us up because I think we've heard so many fascinating observations, ideas that intersect with, e with each other. So um, at first, when I, when I received my copy and I thought, what a powerful collective project and such a modest title, Kurdish Women's Stories, yet so fitting. Uh, when you read the individual accounts by the selected Kurdish women contributors, the enormity um, of the weight of this project, I think, begins to emerge. Um, how much do we know about Kurdish women's experiences as told by so many different Kurdish women? And as Christine mentioned earlier, just like like you were thinking, uh, my initial thought was, this is perfect for a class I'm about to teach. I don't know if you can tell, but every chapter has like little notes for my next course that I'll teach um, related to, you know, women's involvement in revolutionary movements. So the silences about Kurdish women's lives, I think is all around us hardly a mention in oral history projects. And as far as I can tell, historiography is devoid of Kurdish women's voices. Only recently have I seen some digital narratives and photography perhaps as projects that emerge to affirm Kurdish women's agency. So I did a quick search on some of the key terms, um, just like a typical uh, scholar. I was looking through and I was trying to see what do we have out there? Um, when you look for Kurdish women and mother tongue education, just a few articles. If you look at employment, gender-based violence, just a few articles. Maybe a little bit more on persecution and genocide. Some stories are emerging on mental health, however, most of them in the context of larger groups, not focused on Kurdish voices individually, perhaps a bit more to be found in the literature of exile and diaspora. So when I received this book, I decided I needed to spend some quality time with it. I started to read basically one story each night. I, I think I mentioned early on that uh, after the first story, I needed an extra day. It was only two or three pages in length, but I needed an extra day to process. So I kept thinking about individual stories. It affected, it reached my inner core. It, uh, it shaped my thinking about these experiences. Reading this anthology, I think for many of us, if we're Kurdish ourselves or not, we learn new ways of defining physical and emotional spaces. I think we expand our minds by embracing the complexity of Kurdish women's lives, as many of you have mentioned. We grapple with particular struggles of women. We are in awe of their courage and intense demands to redefine themselves in their own ways. So I was thinking, what does it mean to be Kurdish, a woman, and to be involved in writing? I think in its most essential way, it means to be radical. Being Kurdish and a woman is to ask radical questions, to recenter the lived experiences of Kurdish women through a process of acknowledging, thinking, writing. Writing, as many as the co contributors explained in their personal narratives, involves an act of resistance against the cruelties and randomness of authoritarian and patriarchal controls. It requires learning a new language naming and understanding the practices that deny voice and agency to Kurdish women. 
but it also requires us to decolonize the mind at the intersection of so many paths, ethnicity, gender, patriarchy, religion. Through telling different Kurdish women's stories, I think a community is formed. This process of writing and going public can empower Kurdish women from different generations, informed by their realities of life, guided by their ideological positions to connect with each other and to challenge the profound gaps in the acknowledgement of their resourcefulness and survival. This collection, in my view, is important for another reason. When Kurdish women write, they exist. Writing down stories affirms survival and triumph in struggle. I really hope that this anthology is the first of many to come. So thank you to all of you, and I look forward to having a broader conversation. I was just kicked out. Did you finish? <laughs> oh, my internet connection. Oh, damn it. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Isabel, we can hear you. Okay, okay, great. Okay, I'm back. Um, I, my internet connection seems to be unstable. Vera, I, I'm afraid I, I missed maybe the last one and one and a half minutes of what you said. <laughs> That's all right. And um, <laughs> I'm back now. Okay, so thank you all for your um, amazingly insightful reflections um, about this book, what this book means to you. Um, and all these thoughts that came up uh, and how we how we can uh, contextualize them. Uh, but I think um, let's bring our audience in at this stage. Um, should we be democratic and start at the top with the questions? Um, I think uh, the first one is addressed to Christine directly. It says, um, Kurdish women and Kurds generally have been a particular target of Kurdish state repression, uh, Turkish state repression, including mass arrests of Kurdish women. What measures should the UK government take against Turkey? Well, um, I'm, I'm hoping that my response isn't going to be too disappointing here because I'm very much not a professor of political science and um, and international relations and diplomacy and things like that. So um, I'm not entirely sure what our government is doing um, to highlight the um, the issue of human rights in Turkey. But um, it doesn't seem to be very much because we still the UK is a country where Nobody talks about the fact, um, the uh, nature of the authoritarian regime in Turkey, and nobody talks about the human rights violations, and nobody talks about the systematic mistreatment of Kurds. So I, I'm afraid that my answer to that question is, um, they should take a lot more measures than they are doing already. Um, but I'm not really sure that, um, that I can say, um, that I can really say much more than that, because I think that uh, it should be something that the UK is, dialogue, is in dialogue with Turkey about all the time. And I think that it should, the UK should be a place where we read in the media about the sorts of things that happen in Turkey, the mainstream everyday media, and we don't. Um, and everybody will say, oh, there's a, there's a free press in the UK, but there's no doubt that the press in the UK, um, most of the press in the UK does follow agendas um, and discourses that uh, the government um, that are in line with uh, our government's opinions. So, um, yes, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but um, the answer is that our government is not doing enough to highlight what happens in Turkey and it should do more. So maybe I'll help out for a yeah, second yeah, because- yeah. Maybe you know the, more about what- No, 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 I was not gonna say about the, the UK, but we've lost uh, Isabel. And so I was gonna jump in and help out a bit unless 
Um, Huzan, do you want to comment on anything? No? Okay. Yeah, because so, I mean, maybe I, we talk, we're in a room full of activists here, well, virtually speaking. Uh, and I am not an activist. I'm just an academic bystander. So um, maybe one of our activists can actually uh, speak to that question a bit more than I can. Right. So I don't know if anyone in the group wants to speak. Um, Ariane. Yes, um, I, I probably don't count as an activist either, but I just one quick, very quick thing that um, I wanted to say in answer to that question um, was just to delist the PKK as a terrorist organization would be a, a, a massive first step um, because at the moment for as long as kind of Western powers classify um, the PKK as a terrorist organization, um, that means that Turkey feels justified um, in you kind of using these anti-terror um, kind of efforts against the um, against Kurdish people. So I think, you know, that for me would be the quickest kind of or, or, or the um, most immediate and urgent uh, point on which to campaign probably. It also makes a nonsense of all the policies around Rojava and northern Syria as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm back, but it seems my internet connection is not stable enough for the video, so I'm going to remain like this. Um, the next question in the chat was um, what young Kurdish people can read, what book suggestions you have if uh, people want to discover their Kurdish heritage? Well, this one. <laughs> I mean, it, I'm not clear about whether the person would like to read um, sort of more academic books. Um, there's no doubt that since a Kurdish studies has grown, there have been a lot more specialised books that have been written on this or that aspect of Kurdish history. So there are great books about Kurdistan of Iran, say, by Abbas Bali, or um, uh, about how governments process the Kurdish, um, um, the Kurdish issue by uh, people like Hamid Borzaslan, um, but uh, th there aren't, we don't so often get books about the Kurds um, in general. Um, perhaps Michael Gunter's books, um, books like Cranebrook and Spell are very good books in their time, but they're a bit out of date now. Um, and also uh, um, the, the question comes from somebody who's writing in English, so I guess that's their preferred language of reading, but there are obviously many great books in Kurdish and Turkish and the other languages of the states where Kurds live that, um, that would be good. I don't know if any, but what other people would suggest? People who've actually explored their own Kurdish roots, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe Ariane has something, because you were talking about growing up and exploring your roots. No, I'm just as keen to hear about some of these recommendations um, as anybody else. I haven't yet read uh, Dila Derick's uh, book, which I think is coming out this year, isn't it? If it's not out already. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of that. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think there's probably lots out there that I myself have not have not kind of um, come across, I suppose. I think uh, for me, so much of my learning has kind of come from talking to relatives, talking to my dad a lot, from whom I've learned such a such a tremendous amount. And um, I think that's another thing that people can do if they do want to to learn about Kurdistan um, is is to get to know Kurds who will happily tell them about Kurdistan, you know, and and their experiences um, of living there. And there are lots of solidarity groups across the UK um, which people can join. Um, and that's a fantastic way of kind of, um, you know, sort of joining in with the kind of political side of things, um, but also learning um, about Kurdish people. Yeah. Vera, what do you recommend to people? Yeah, so I really, instead of relying on texts, I usually recommend that you connect with a solidarity group or an organization in your town or in your area. So we have a few Kurdish groups that gather here in the upstate New York area. 
So we, we have meetings, we discuss current events, or we used to, um, we might again this summer, but it's, it's more about exchanging of personal experiences and what it means to grow up um, in the diaspora. And I think um, there really is, it's really difficult because as you know, many of you know, I, I'm from Germany, I grew up there and you know, I have a totally different context of who I interact with in Germany among the diaspora than here in upstate New York. It's a different kind of um, diaspora organized differently and, and representing a different ideological positioning sometimes. So I think it's really important to find others rather than relying on textual interpretations, I think you should go out and meet as many people as you can to sort of gather more information about what your heritage might be looking like, is interpreted as, and you know what you personally connect with, I would think. I would like to say a couple of things as well. Um, I think um, I would like to draw people's attention to Culture Project website in English. We have it's cultureproject.org.uk. Uh, there are a lot of writings, articles, poetry, art reviews, and um, essays about Kurdish people, Kurdish women. So I, I suggest people can look into that as well uh, for quick, <laughs> quick information here and there. Uh, also, there are lots of questions in the chat. I want to respond to a couple of them, maybe, uh, Vera, if it's OK. Uh, there's a question about how difficult it is for women to speak about their experiences or tell their stories. Um, um, as far as I remember, it has been difficult for women to speak about themselves, about their aspiration, about their rights, about their lives, simply because there's too many other political issues going on and because of too many political struggles and everything overrides women's rights and presence and place um, in history as well as in the struggle. So that's why it makes, I mean, I spoke to so many women who really had uh, such strong stories to tell and finally they did write what they were saying is like they've been 10 years um, a Peshmerga fighter or they've been to prison for a few years tortured and so on and then they would say oh yeah but there are hundreds of women who suffered the same or there are thousands of Kurdish women who have gone through the same thing and why it is important to say it so you know there is this kind of uh, modesty I would say like they're too modest about their huge struggles and sufferings um, in the world. That's why I think it made it uh, difficult for them to speak about it, but also because too much, uh, as I mentioned it in the introduction of my book, too much emphasis is put on male as a fighter, as a writer, as, a, as an artist, as the great this and great that. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, kind of glorification of male figure in all struggles, in poetry, in literature, in everything. And that made it a lot more difficult for women to feel like their stories is as powerful of men. I mean, lately in uh, Southern Kurdistan, the bookstores are full of uh, biographies written by ex Peshmerga fighters who are now um, part of the Kurdish establishment. They are writing about their great days of being a Peshmerga against Saddam's regime and so on. And you hardly hear anything about the mobilization of women in this struggle, their wives and sisters or other women in the society who were involved in clandestine. Uh, mobilization and also who were in prisons and uh, so many of them who were also killed. So there was very, very hardly any mention of the women's sacrifices and struggle. So I think, you know, this collection of women's stories, Kurdish women's stories, um, is as a beginning to really support other women who have had the history of struggle, of sacrifices, of powerful contribution to the society. Uh, in all its, um, you know, uh, aspects, to be able to write, and I think this is the beauty of Kurdish women's stories. And then when, when we published it in Kurdistan, it it become popular, and I can see now more women and are, are telling their stories, and more other women journalists are trying to document 
other women's lives and, and struggles as well. So just to mention that, um, that was my answer to one of the questions I saw. Great, thank you so thank much. You. And and I, I want to come back to you in a minute uh, with question five for sure as well. Um, did any of the other speakers want to comment on, on the question of um, how difficult it is um, to record the stories for women to, to talk? If that is not the case, then- um... Well, maybe um, I can say something about when you do research on it, I don't think it is actually, in my case, I don't believe it is appropriate for me to just ask somebody to tell me their story. I think you have to establish a relationship. You have to have a trust-based um, way of working with each other here in the United States. And I'm sure in many other countries, there are internal review boards that require you to go through um, a process to make sure you do no harm, uh, you don't uh, traumatize just out of your own interest and curiosity about something. So, um, uh, you know, our scholarly work has to be reviewed. Also, I wanted to contextualize a little bit here in the United States under the prior administration. Um, it is quite possible you could have been deported had you spoken on engagement with a guerrilla organization. Let me just say I've worked on Latin American issues um, and uh, in the past. And if you were, for example, a person who was granted temporary stay in the United States and you had been publicly acknowledging as a woman, for example, that you were a participant in the FARC, you could have been deported to Colombia and then immediately arrested and, uh, you know, suffered the consequences. So it's not just as easy as just walking up to somebody and saying, tell me your story. So I'm sure that's not what, what, what was meant, but I wanted to contextualize that we all carry a serious responsibility for how we pursue such a process. And we have to um, think about the participants and their burden um, in so many different ways. Thank you, Vera. Um, and this is actually a nice link to the next question where Sarah asks about international so solidarity and what that could look like in the context of Afrin right now, especially with women in Afrin who are suffering from the Turkish occupation and all the violence that um, uh, comes hand in hand with that. And especially as we are fighting mainstream media for truth, she's asking. Who would like to talk about international solidarity? I am looking at, <laughs> no, you talk yourself. <laughs> Ruken, do you want to say something? Or Ariane? Well, yeah, I can say some. Well, the, uh, so the, in, uh, the solidarity we also need, need to, I, I'm going to say the same word maybe, decolonize the international solidarities. It is not just, you know, like we're going to go help these people, but learn from them, you know, what is their struggle look like, you know, uh, what kind of a struggle they engage with. Learn from them. Uh, but yeah, the, the international solidarity will be very important. As I said, you know, now we have a lot of different books are written by for, on Kurds. I think the publicity is really important for Kurds because, as I said, it's a stateless nation, so no one knows them, mostly. Like, I, I live in the United States, and for almost 15 years, I have to explain the, I have to go back to World War One. you know, how we were divided. So it is the cycle, and I have to tell the story. I'm not a story, but I have to tell a lot of things about history, even, like, to my neighbors, yeah, in just a couple, like, in, in, in a conversation, like, in seconds, I have to summarize everything. So international solidarity, I think, really important uh, for Kurds to be, to be recognized and also uh, for 
for Kurds, like we need to hear their stories. What are they going through? As I said, you know, in my uh, very uh, short uh, presentation, yeah, we like even right now, many people are suffering in Turkey, especially Kurdish women activists are in jail. Uh, they have been uh, labeled as terrorists, although they are not terrorists. Like the MPs, mayors, co-mayors, they're all jail right now. And it's, it's not just um, impacting their Kurdish identity, but also their struggle against patriarchy can also affect that they can't work. Like even during the COVID, for example, yeah, a lot of we hear about violence against women, but then these Kurdish women actors have been arrested. So how are they gonna fight against this violence against women or male violence? So I think international solidarity and writing about Kurds, um, holding events about Kurds, I think will be important. Thank you. Um, I hope that answers. Um, so, yep. Oh, is that my connection again? Ariane, did you want to say something as well? Yeah, I can. I can say something quick on that question. Um, I think it's important to kind of bring together in the public imagination around this that view that that excitement that everybody had about Rojava, especially a couple of years ago. Um, and the fact that what seems to have happened really is that people have been quite happy to get excited about the kind of revolutionary politics going on there, but have not been quite so loyal in actually kind of standing up for um, the various um, kind of forms of oppression that, um, Kurds in Syria and in Turkey um, are experiencing. Um, and so, and, and this kind of plays into this narrative that um, Kurds have always had, which is one of abandonment, you know, of when it's when when things are going good, people, people will be with them. And then when things get difficult, suddenly there's nobody around. And I think really, if you want to show solidarity, you have to not repeat that pattern, you know. And I think if people were excited about that revolutionary politics, then you know, stay tuned, you know, be there for the difficulty as well, be there for the trouble um, and make sure you're saying as much about what is difficult as you were about saying what was so wonderful there, or what is so wonderful there. Um, and so I think it's just kind of recognizing that that's how solidarity works, um, that you can ad admire and be part of a political movement from a distance, but you've also um, got to be ready to stand up for the people who are part of it. Uh, great, and, and that also links to the next question where a pariah is asking, uh, for many Kurds that are living in uh, the diaspora, there seems to be similar experiences amongst them. Do you think Kurds would benefit from alliances with organizations that advocate for people in the diaspora? Maybe Hosan? <laughs> um. I like in my own experience of in the past 22, 23 years in London, and I have collaborated with many different organizations, academics, uh, wonderful people, individuals, and it has helped a lot in terms of publicizing issues I wanted to be known. For example, I've been campaigning a lot for Kurdish women's rights and that type of alliances and um, support and solidarity meant a lot in terms of really putting pressure and uh, making our issues known. Um, so yeah, I would welcome any alliances between Kurdish communities and organizations and with British or worldwide organizations that care about human beings basically. And I think we live in a world that today um, uh, there are too many problems. There are too many political problems everywhere. And sometimes it, it makes it difficult for people to really be able to have solidarity with everyone around the world. And uh, yeah, but I think in terms of, of supporting the uh, revolution in Rojava is really, really important. And that exposing the Turkish government's genocide in Afrin and other parts is very important to be exposed as much as possible and to bring 
like to keep Turkey responsible for what they are doing. Uh, also, uh, in terms of Bakur, I mean, all these political prisoners um, in North Kurdistan by Erdogan's government is just a crime. Uh, and these are elected people, um, deputies and mayors and uh, political activists, mainly women are being in prison. Turkish prisons are full of mainly Kurdish political uh, activists. Uh, and it's a crime really. I mean, if you talk about freedom, people should be able to say and write and, and have activities and have freedom of association and assembly. So they, Turkey has been violating all these rights. Um, so I think the more we expose these violations, the more we can uh, support civilians on the ground to be able to really um, make impact and have um, their voices heard. I mean, it's so difficult. I mean, when you look at Iran as well, every now and then several Kurdish activists are either executed or arrested, even teachers for teaching Kurdish language voluntarily, they are um, also arrested. And I mean, there's so much to be done. I mean, for anybody who really wants to have solidarity, there's a lot to be done in for all parts of Kurdistan. And there are many organizations and I mean, we at Culture Project, we really want to kind of create this platform to have different voices represented, mainly to um, kind of look into women's, um, Kurdish women in art and literature and poetry and so on, and have women's writings as well uh, published. Um, but also beside, we do political campaigning when it comes to various issues. And I have been very outspoken in support of Rojava revolution and any other parts of Kurdistan really. So I think there's a lot of space for collaboration, for alliances, and for solidarity work. Um, and I would welcome that. Thank you. Could I maybe say something really quickly on public engagement? Um, because I think one of the fundamental issues is also that mainstream media outlets, be it television or newspapers, generally avoid speaking on the Kurdish issue. And not to even, I mean, nothing about the experiences of women, but every interview you see these days on Iran will involve a question on nuclear arrangements. Uh, it involve, would involve, you know, future relations. It, it will involve something about the oil uh, business, but nothing. Nobody will ever ask a question about Kurdish human rights, violence against Kurds, or the treatment or, and the experiences of women. So that is something that we have to publicly, publicly push against. I mean, over and over again. Every time something is published about Turkey and Erdogan and authoritarianism, and there is nothing mentioned about the imprisonment of Kurdish political leaders, how is that even possible? And I think we have to hold politicians, newspapers, TV outlets, anybody accountable for their lack of integration of that issue. And that is on all of us, at least here in the United States, in terms of my context. Um, and then Kahin is asking how we can help to get the book uh, into as many hands as possible. And that's perhaps a question for Kieran. Kieran, do you want? <laughs> no, no. Okay, uh, Hosan then. Okay, well, I think it's important to really write reviews about the book and publish it in powerful journals or powerful websites and um, read it, please buy it, uh, write about it, publicize for it on social media. And um, I think that way we can just get this book read as much as possible. Uh, reviews are very important in my opinion. And uh, also for, the, for academics to uh, put it into the reading list. And I'm so happy that so many of you already uh, are doing that. Um, and really, yeah, just 
you know, suggesting it to your departments, to your libraries, if you are a university student or if you are a, an academic, put it into a reading list. And um, if you are a journalist, academic, again, lots of people can write reviews about it. There is some website where the book is there. People can write their feeling, their reviews. I think that would all help. Um, uh, and, and the book is available on so many websites, um, uh, including on Pluto Press website, as well as on Amazon and lots of other in different countries could be purchased online from different um, bookstores. So that's it really, I think. Excellent advertising. Um, <laughs> now the next question is directed directly to uh, Ruken. Um, Elif is asking, recently I had the pleasure of being part of translating a Kurdish women's prisoner's fictional story. How do you feel that that experience fits with the experience of Kurdish women's stories? All right. Uh, thanks, Elif, for bringing that up. So uh, we found a, a, a prisoner, who, a woman prisoner, political prisoner, who been in jail since uh, 1994, like for 26 years now. So she has Nibel Genç. Uh, she has written uh, a novel, and then a part of that novel is going to be published at a university uh, journal. So as I said, as I mentioned earlier, I do think that Kurdish women have very strong voices, but we need spaces. So this like Pluto Press, thank you for them, and also Huzan for doing this great job uh, for collecting the stories. So we need this kind of spaces for women to just voice themselves. They do have voices, I, we just need to bring them. And especially in English, like there are some, for example, now there are some collections in written in Turkish by, for example, Gültan Kışanak, one of the, the former mayor of the Diyarbakir, who is in jail right now. She had a really strong uh, book uh, that the, the women are telling their uh, experiences in, uh, in, in politics and activism, but like it's in Turkish, so like, the, this Pluto Press or like the publishers in English, they should look into and translating all of these uh, great narratives. I think that will be important. As I said, like we need spaces, seriously. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, this uh, brings me to the last question. Um, um, which is directed at Hosan, but obviously everyone is uh, very welcome to comment. And the question is by Hevalo, uh, who's asking, what does Hosan think about the new book by Gael Zemach Lemon called The Daughters of Kobani, which has, of course, caused a bit of a controversy, not so much the book, but the, but the, the film rights. What does Hosan think about that? God, that's a tough question. <laughs> I, I really welcome any books written about Kurds, for that matter, or Kurdish women or political struggles, as long as it gives exposure to their, you know, just cause. Um, I haven't read it, so I cannot really give my opinion on it. And I wouldn't want to say anything more, more in terms of the book itself, but I have read some of the articles written particularly critical about the role of Hillary Clinton and her daughter by adopting it to their um, company to turn it into a drama series or something like that. Um, I mean, I can, I can see why people are criticizing that for uh, Clinton's involvement and keeping a blind eye on what Turkish government have been doing and also for still uh, listing PKK as a terrorist organization. So lots of other reasons that people find this hypocritical on one hand, you know, you keep a blind eye on Turkey. On the other hand, you really, um, the real terrorist is the Turkish state uh, who is terrorizing people, who is invading Kurdish cities and, and uh, uh, arresting people and killing people where, and on the other hand, adopting a book to be uh, turned into a series, which is about Kurdish women and their uh, revolution. But um, I don't know, I'm not skeptical, but I'm not also um, like too happy about it. I don't know because I haven't read the book, but as I said, generally, 
I would welcome uh, people, journalists, academics, students, whoever wants to do research to write about Kurdish people. And, and from here, I would really like to say that in Kurdish women's stories, these 25 stories, people who are involved in um, art, in literature, in writing plays, in performances, they can easily adapt these stories uh, to be turned into other artistic forms. And, and um, I would welcome that for, for people to really um, uh, look into Kurdish women's stories for these authentic um, Kurdish voices to be turned into any other art forms really, uh, or even to have documentaries made about these women further. So I, I do welcome things to be done by our supporters, wherever they are in the world. And um, as long as there's a good intention <laughs> behind it, uh, not politically motivated to cover something else. Um, yeah, that's my view really. Did any of the other speakers want to comment on this? Okay, if that's not the case, um, I wanted to end this conversation by uh, one quick last question to Hosan about her next project. Now that this um, book has been completed and is out of your hands and out in the world, um, what are you going to be working on next? Uh, what's what's on the table? Isabel, there are so many other things in my mind, but I wouldn't say anything about it right now. There's something me, Rukin, and another friend are working on it at the moment, but I wouldn't say much about it. It's a bit sensitive. But I would like to say something. Um, in Culture Project, we keep on doing things and trying to... Uh, create profiles for Kurdish women, to have writings by Kurdish women and uh, translating them into English. So I would really like to use this opportunity to call on people who have good skills in translation, in editing English, in, I don't know, finding support for our projects in Cut Project. I would welcome that. So feel free to contact me. And another thing I would like to uh, agree with Rokin uh, when she said, uh, we don't give voices to Kurdish women because they have powerful voices already. And I've never tried to say that I am the voice of Kurdish women or I give voices to Kurdish women. No, because it took me many years to really find my own voice you know, being lost in a lot of political upheavals and struggles and exile and being a refugee again and displaced and moving from one place to another. I like, as Ariana said in the beginning, this book is pieces, is fragments. And at the end, really, I just, when I finished editing the book and collecting all these stories, I just thought putting all these pieces together, I can see myself, you know, and I can see lots of wounds in my own, um, memories in my own heart, in my own being that really kind of, I was back in touch with that. And um, it's very important to really, as even as Kurdish women, not to claim that we are uh, giving voices or we are the voices of other Kurdish women because each woman, no matter Kurdish or not, are very unique in their own existence. And I wanted really that uniqueness to be reached out um, and to be told and to be heard um, by readers around the world. These are the Kurdish women and this is who they could be and this is who they are. And I only facilitated, that's how I see myself and my role in this project. Uh, and my friends and I uh, at Culture Project, we only facilitated, we, we provided that platform only, that space as Rokin said, for the women just to tell their stories. And they were, all of them were extremely happy to find out that it was translated into English and that it was published. So many of them gave me such powerful um, feelings that they felt relieved, that they felt uh, they can even die now as long as their story can live on. I mean, lots of really positive feedback from the women um, in the book made me, um, it, it, it meant the whole world to me. That's all I want to say. And thank you everyone so much for those who joined the talk and for all of you who made time despite your busy schedules um, to be present here and to talk so positively about this book. It really, really made me feel proud and humble. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, everyone, please uh, join me in, in a virtual applause for Hosan and the book. And thank you everyone for... <laughs> 
joining this conversation tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.